Chapter 3, right? Yes, sir. Of collusions. <laughs> if then... Okay, right. If then you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking those things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are of this earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, greeds, which amount to idolatry. For it is on account of these things that the wrath of God will come, and in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also have put them all aside, all aside, your angers, wrath, malice, slanders, and abusive speech from your mouth. Stop lying to one another, since you laid aside your old self which is, with its evil practices, and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free man, but Christ is in all and is all. <clears throat> and so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, to put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, you should also forgive them. Uh, and beyond all this, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Now let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, in which you indeed were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonish one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to him, uh, to, to God the Father, through him to God the Father. Wives, be subject to your husband, as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, that they may not lose heart. Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service uh, as those who merely please men, but with the sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do all your work heartily as for the Lord rather than just for men, knowing that it is from the Lord you shall receive your reward in the inheritance, for it is the Lord Jesus whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of that wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. All right, this Bible is falling apart. My pages. What version is that? Uh, New American Standard. But it's a it's an educational person, so you don't have to be able to find that anymore. Unless you go to unless you go to a seminary. Every time I break my it's very much more confusing because it's the St. James my head. Well there because Bibles that they're all you get, James version. You get denominational influence, you get, you know, ideological influences. The ones they use in seminary are strictly just word for word translation. A lot, in fact, a lot of times the words are transposed. Uh, if I said, uh, go and run, ye, run thee to the shed, the way it was written is be run ye to the shed. You know, and, and you've got to reverse it and turn it around. <laughs> huh? Up the hill and Jack and Jill with that pail of water. Yeah. Up the hill, yeah. Anyway, that's just the way it is. <laughs> and there's a... Huh? Yoda speaking. Do I what? Yoda speaking. Yes. Huh? <laughs> is that Pinger? Oh. Pinger. She told me she bumped her head and she might be crazy. I said, how... How will I know any difference? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> no, the same bump. What do you think? Very simple word. You've got to remember that Paul never, ever, ever visited this church. Never went there. He was not able to. He wanted to, but he never got there. He was killed before he was able to get to the Colossian church. Or Colossae, if you've ever been there. It's a giant temple. Kind of like the Colossus of Egypt, but a little smaller. Anyway, uh, that was a temple to Athena, I believe. I can't remember exactly, but one of the Greek gods. And uh, Paul, or not Paul, but Timothy and, and uh, uh, Adonis, I believe. He, uh, or Apollos, it was Apollos who start, helped start that church there. In light of, kind of interesting, because you had this huge temple, and then they went, and started this tiny little church next to it and it was always in the shadow of this huge temple right next door. So they had to deal with that and there was a lot of fertility worship and all that going on in here and nevertheless the Colossians started this little church which eventually turned out to be one of the best churches, Christian churches that was started in the Mediterranean area. Uh, they were loving people, they were kind people, and they really took their Christianity seriously, not just something to do on Sunday morning. I mean, to, for them it was a life style. It wasn't just something you kind of do occasionally if, it, if the time is right. So the Colossian church was kind of one of those little miracles that Paul never really had anything to do with, but exploded and just became a wonderful church anyway. All right? In Revelation, they didn't say anything about the Colossian church. Uh -huh. It wasn't one of the bad ones. <laughs> no, on the contrary, it was one of the good ones. Okay, what do you think about this chapter? It's basically, like I said, it's the completion of last week. We saw the if-then statement, right? Yep. If you're going to be a Christian, then that Christianity must be founded or grounded, if you will, defined in terms of the Lord, not the world. Okay? So if you're in Jesus, then this is the way you ought to, first of all, know or understand the world. You, as Paul likes to say so many times, should take that which you know and let it influence you, E N C. Let it influence the world rather than the other way around. See, the world wants to tell you how to believe about Jesus if they tell you to believe in him at all. Most of the time, the world just simply rejects it. And it's not so much they're rejecting an idea of a savior or a God so much as they are rejecting the idea of having to submit to another authority. You know, we all like to be our own king, right? We all like to be our own boss. We all like, we hate it when we have a boss over us and that boss turns out not to be a good boss and we, you know, we have to put up with these guys and 99% of the fussing and fighting about your job in the workplace today is about what? Well, it's about a boss over whoever's fussing <laughs> that they can't stand. Well, as it is in our real life, it bleeds over into our spiritual life. And this is one of the barriers of Christianity today is that instead of Christianity influencing the world, it's the world that wants to influence Christianity. And part of that world is, is what? us part of that world is us see because we want to be our own gods we want to be our own control of my own life Barbara's not going to tell me what to do and Barbara's saying Tom is not going to tell me what to do okay neither one of us are going to tell each other what to do because you're your boss I'm my boss and ne'er the two shall ever meet uh, so then when Jesus comes into the scene or Bob comes in and says, you need to believe in Jesus. And I say, what's 
uh, involved in that and you say, well, you've got to submit to his authority and his understanding and define yourself in him, what am I going to say to that? Another boss. Forget about it. Not interested. And this is one of the biggest uh, barriers, if you will, to Christianity today because we can't get past this if. If there's no if, then what do you think the chances are that there's going to be a, z a then? If I cannot convince you that Jesus Christ, or God, if you will, is, is and should be a priority in your life, is a fair judge, is the righteous holder of all life, both on this earth and the next, and if I cannot get you to submit to that authority, then what chance have I ever got for you to live as a Christian man or woman? Well, none is the answer to that. This is the biggest problem right here. It's trying to get you to see Jesus not so much as a horrible taskmaster, but as a loving Lord. Unfortunately, for the last 2,000 years, we've been treating, uh, preaching him as a horrible taskmaster. Much like those who enslaved the Jews in Egypt. You know, the crack of the whip. Jesus, God's going to send you to hell. God's going to damn you forever. God's going to... And pretty soon the world says, I don't need another boss. And they turn away. And Europe, which was once an incredibly Christian country, is now maybe 1% to 2% Christian in the whole of Europe. The giant cathedrals that they spent hundreds of years building in tribute and praise to God, they sit empty. Uh, they're nothing more than tourist attractions. You pay your two euros and you go in and you look at all the stained glass. Oh, isn't this wonderful? They built it 700 years ago. But there's nobody there worshiping. There's nobody there using the building for, for the purpose of which it was constructed. Pretty amazing when you see these giant, huge cathedrals. I'm talking huge. And the way that they beat people to, in order to build it. Well, that's true. But I think the only one that's really used in any, any regular basis is St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican. I mean, they still carry on the traditions and all that there. But I've been in a thousand of those cathedrals across Europe. And, you know, there's a couple of nuns in there, you know, polishing stuff and keeping it clean. And you put down a euro and you get two or three postcards, pictures, you know, and basically you walk around, oh, ah, ooh, looking at these incredible altars and edifices all over the place. And then you walk out and you go get a sandwich. And that's it. Pretty amazing. Why? Well, because of this right here. The world, we say, oh, well, the world's changed. No, it hasn't. The world is as it's always been. And what is that? Well, it wants its own selfish wants. Everybody wants to be king of the world. Everybody at least wants to be king of their world. You see what I'm saying? And as long as you can't have two kings, you got to have one or you got to have the other. And that's just basic human understanding. So when Paul writes to the Colossians, he makes this plain in the first, I want to say chapter 1 and half of 2, and then the other half of 2 and 3 is, if you can define yourself in Christ, then, based on what you know, should be influencing your world. How is that so? Well, first of all, First and foremost, you got to put away the selfish desires and lusts of yourself. C L F I S H. Now, the key word here, and I don't mean to be ugly by using the word selfish, but the key word here is self. You got to put against away the angers and the you know the slanders, and on and on it goes. Everything that the world does, you gotta not do. The lust, the passions, the immoralities, the all that crazy stuff. Basically, he's talking about the temple next door. 
And what you gotta do is replace all of this with the defining Jesus. And that is the kindness and gentleness and the patience and especially forgiveness. Nothing characterizes the definition of God in your life than the ability to forgive. To say it's okay, Frida. Okay, Chuck, you busted my lawnmower. I'll just get another one. Forget about it. Barbara, you burnt my biscuits again. I forgive you. The ability to forgive is one of the most tell signs of Christ in your life than anything else on this planet. People ask me all the time, Tom, how will I know if I'm walking in Christ? Well, are you harboring any grudges? You got any angers against anybody? You got any resentments? You got any vengeance in you that you want to get even with somebody? If you got any of those, then no, you're probably not walking in Christ. If you've forgiven those who have wronged you, even though they didn't deserve it, then there might be a little evidence of Christ. If you've forgiven those in your family, your idiot brother, or your stupid sister, whatever, then you probably got a little bit of Christ in your life. If you've forgiven your mom or dad who you feel have wronged you or threw you out of the house or whatever, and maybe you got a little bit of Christ. This is the number one telltale sign of whether or not you're walking to the Lord. Is do you have the ability to forgive another? And lastly, do you have the ability to forgive yourself? A lot of people hold grudges not so much against God, but against themselves. Oh, I suck. Oh, I'm just miserable. I'm terrible. I've done all this in my past. I am the worst person on the planet. God would never love me. Well, He would love you if you'd let Him. He would forgive you if you let Him. Forgive yourself. Let it go. We've all lost a race or two in our lives. We've all dropped the ball a couple of times. Doesn't matter the reason. We've done it. We've all been at one time, as the Lord says, uh, fallen short of the glory of God. We've all acted on our own behalf. We've all gone like sheep astray. We've all gone after the greener grass on the other side of the hill. We've all thought about ourselves before any and everybody else. Go to a fellowship dinner and watch who jumps in that line first. <laughs> and you think, oh, we're not selfish. Ah. Watch who jumps in the line first. Now, granted, somebody's got to obviously be first. But if you see a pattern, then you can begin to think to yourself, hmm, hmm. I never go first. I always wait to the end. Because I'm hoping you guys will, you know, if I see you all eat and not die. <laughs> but Tom, that's selfish. <laughs> well, yes, but it looks noble. <laughs> How do I know if I'm walking in, my, in Christ? Well, if, if there's any hint of this in your life, you might be. Now, the last thing he says at the very end is, not only is this knowing got to be brought over to the living, of course, this is Paul's definition of faith. The knowing has got to make the transference into living, but this living should begin where? Charity begins at home. Well, that is a lie. Oftentimes, home is the biggest war ground, battleground. 
devastated area that there ever is. Husbands yell at wives, wives yell at husbands, moms yell at children, children hate parents. I mean, even the dog gets kicked once in a while. Get out of the way. What does the dog do for crying out loud? He has no voice in the matter, literally. I ought to start at home. You're never going to be nice to Chuck, the neighbor, if you can't be nice to your own wife, to your own children. Uh, it's, got to, it's got to be practiced first and foremost at home. This is why at the end, and I'm not going to make this into a, uh, a man thing or a woman thing, a male or female thing, but he says, wives, be submissive to your husband. The word there, submissive, is really a misnomer. It says, a better translation is wives, be a companion and a workmate or a helper to your husband. Work together for crying out loud. And husbands, don't exasperate your kids or your children. Work with them. Everybody work with everybody because there's a better way of doing things and it's called love. Well, what is love? Well, first of all, God is love. Well, what does that mean? What that means is all of this. Actually lived out. Paul says, I'm going to give, you know, you're going to get the gifts of the Spirit. What are the gifts of the Spirit? Love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, all that neat stuff. Well, what are those? That's God's resume for crying out loud. That's God's resume. Those are all His characteristics that you are now given and enabled to enact in your life. Let your life now, filled with the Spirit of God, the gifts of God, influence your world, not the other way around. Bob, the world's going to tell you, you need to screw Tim over here and later because you deserve the job more than him and you deserve the raise more than him and you deserve the big house more than him. So do whatever you got to do more than him to get what you want. And then you'll be a hero. That's what the world's going to tell you. But the man of God would stand up and say, I'm not going to hurt Tim that I might prosper. I'm not going to, you know, destroy his business so that mine can thrive. If I'm a good businessman, I need to make changes in my business, not destroy his. See what I'm saying? Whole different perspective. In fact, I'll do all I can to protect him and in the meantime, try and rebuild, figure out my mistakes and do it differently. Give up the one Exactly. Exactly. But see, the world's going to tell you you're an idiot. If you want to thrive, you've got to take out the competition. That means Tim's shop's got to go down, Chuck's shop's got to go down, and we're not even going to talk about Kathy's shop. We'll light that on fire. Huh? All you have to do is do your business better. Exactly. See, by me putting down someone else doesn't raise me up at all. In fact, it drags me lower than the person I put down. But that's not the world talking. That's the Lord talking. You want to be first? Be last. You want to be greatest? Be least. You want to be master? Then be the servant of everybody else. Man, that sounds familiar. Who said that? Oh, uh, God. Not only do you subject your authority to Him, but you subject your authority to everyone else on the planet. Love begins at home. But I'm the macho man. Yeah, well, she's your wife. You chose her, you loved her, you stood before God and promised your life to her. How is it you're lording yourself over, over her now? Because the man is the leader of the household. <laughs> Says who? In another letter, Paul says, Wives, be submissive to your husbands. And he says, men, be loving of your wife as Christ was for his church. Ooh. Wife, be submissive to your husband. I need you to go to the store for me. I need you to do this, clean your house, blah, blah, blah. Husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Now, how did he do love the church? He died for it. 
little bit bigger commitment there than to just mop the floors. And <laughs> he died for it. He loved the church in any way possible, every way possible, in any place, every time possible. Even to the ultimate sacrifice upon the cross. That's how much God loved his church. Husband, love your wives as God loved his church. Mm hmm. Where's the selfishness in that? Second evidence that you might have a little Christ in your life is right here. If there's love in the home, if there's kindness in the home, if there's charity in the home, if there's patience in the home, if there's gentleness in the home, all these wonderful things. All the fruits of the Spirit, if they're in the home, might be a little bit of evidence that Christ is in your life. See what I'm saying? Now, Paul never went to this church, but he's preaching basically the elements of faith. To know your Lord, understand your Lord, submit to your Lord through a conscious decision, and then live for your Lord by virtue of His characteristics, not yours or the world's. If you can do this, as he says, you got nothing to worry about. When God reveals himself, he'll reveal you as well. If you can do this, you got nothing to worry about. When God comes, well, he'll say, Freedom, come home with me. You're my child. He'll say, Good, well done, good and faithful Kathy. Come into the rest of your father. He'll say, Cucaracha, Harisco, Nel, Nel, Tempo, de Bertolito. Yeah, whatever. And then come home. <laughs> When he shows up, you won't have to sweat it. Oh, I hope I get into heaven. What do you mean? You hope you'll get into heaven. It's like going home to your dad, whom you love, and he loves you. You knock on the door, Dad! My boy is home. Come on. Why would you sweat that? Of course, if you hate your dad, you never did anything with him or for him or respected him, then you might have a problem. That's how Paul makes it so simple. If you are a believer of Christ, first of all, he should define you. Second of all, there should be a conscious submission of, of your own life, your own authority. And thirdly, you ought to see some evidence of it somewhere. Can you do that? And if, and then... Well, when God reveals Himself, don't sweat it. You got nothing to worry about. Why wouldn't mom or dad call their own, let their own children come into the house? Think about it. First place love ought to be evident is where? At home, in your house. Who are you closer to than your own wife, than your own children? And stop kicking the dog roller, Bob. All right, that's chapter 3, folks. Paul is making Christianity practical. If it's not practical, if it's not practiced in the home, then it's just ideology. And ideologies change every day. So, okay, I believe this is good today, but bad tomorrow. Who here remembers when eggs were good? And then the government said eggs are not good. Don't eat them because cholesterol will kill you. And now what are they saying about eggs? Oh, they're good. <laughs> That's an ideology. You know, who remembers when butter was bad? So we went to the, the oleos and the margarines and all that stuff. And then everybody started getting cancer everywhere. And now they're saying, oh, well, margarines are good. Now what are they saying? Margarines are bad. Go back to the original butter. Just get the real butter. Natural butter. Mm hmm. <laughs> Raw sugar versus processed sugar, you know, this and that. Margarine is one molecule off away from the The day we invented spam was the day we started going downhill. <laughs> that was the worst. Processed meats, man. <laughs> 
You're going to grind up that dog and put it in a can, as they call it spam. Evelyn brought some of that home one day and needed to, to file 13 before it was even open. <laughs> oh, man. One year at our Christmas party, somebody opened their present. It was a whole case of spam. Oh. <laughs> spam, 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 spam. Ideologies change just like that with each and every successive generation it changes why well because it's of the world It is defined by the individuals So as the individuals rise up and die and new individuals rise up and take their place They're gonna think different and they're gonna look out for their own wants. So Whatever you believed in before is going to change with the next generation and the next and the next and the next However, if you have a timeless God who controls the world and everything therein, who never changes, what are the odds that it won't change? It'll stay the same. Well, that's what we're banking on. That's what we're calling eternal life. You cannot let the generation of the world di dictate, excuse me, or define what you believe about God. You must let God influence and define your world. And it should be defined in these elements down here. Period. It's not a two-way street. The world's going to do what the world's going to do, but you've got to counter it by saying, no, I march to a different drum. I have a different set of rules defining me. I play by a different leader. Not by me. The last thing you want, Roger Bob, is for me to be in control of this world. Because I will screw it up. <laughs> Badly. All right, that's chapter three. In the last century, was Christianity considered to be a pagan religion? When was Christianity considered a pagan religion? I don't know that it ever was. It was set up to resist the pagan religions. Well, you know, the part of the problem is, is you had the not Jews and you had the Jews. And as much as they hated each other, they did get along with each other in terms of trade and world commerce. The ones that were left out were the, what at that time they considered the desert dwellers, the nomads, the Arabs, basically. And they were kind of left out of that European Jewish Middle Eastern trade thing you know and they, they didn't trade much with them and, and they wanted to get back in it so around the 900s late 800s 900s a man named Suleiman who became known as Suleiman the Great decided that he would get them back into the trade into the trade world and prove to the world that they were not these lawless renegade nomadic desert dwellers. They were just average Joes living in tents. So they wrote a book which later became known as the Koran, which has been changed a thousand times since then. But at first it was just a why can't we all get along book. In fact, half the scriptures in it were from the scriptures of the Testaments. You know, the New and Old Testaments, so that they could impress the Jews saying, look, we're not that much different than you are. And a lot of it was philosophy and ideology, so they could say to the Greeks and the Romans, look, we're not that much different than you are. And all was well with the world, at least, until another generation came up, and another generation came up, and another generation came up, and they began to change it. At first it was like, well, we'll trade with the, with the other people, even though they don't believe like we. And then it was, okay, we'll trade a little with the infidels, but okay, we're not going to trade with the infidels at all. And then as each generation went by, now it's kill anybody who doesn't think or act like we do. Well, gee, isn't that... But was there ever a time when Christianity was considered pagan? I don't know. Well, it was considered paganish by the by the Stoics and all those guys of Greece. Because Pagan is, 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 is usually one religion has more than one deity. Right. More than, one, more than one God. The Greeks had a problem with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They said, well, you guys are worshiping three gods. 
And the Christian responded by saying, we're not. It's the same God. It's just three different purposes. God the Father, the Creator. Jesus, the Redeemer of the creation that went bad. And the Spirit of God, which now empowers that creation restored to continue to live in a holy fashion. It's one God, three purposes. And they couldn't get past that. Uh, so no, Christianity never had a pantheon of gods. Yeah, no, but that's, that is, the question is like, was it ever pagan? I don't think it was. No, no, it was never. By the time the Christian was in church, the Greek pantheon was already assumed by the Well, Roman. let me tell you what happened. The world got involved. By the time the Dark Ages came along, the church was as corrupt as anybody else on the planet. Uh, if you think of, remember back to the Inquisitions and things of that nature, the horrors and the tortures, the land grabbing, the money grabbing, uh, the church was somewhere along the line, the church, the men who ran it, forgot about the Lord. Except when they put on all their big hats and robes and stood up in the pulpit and then after that was over, they went back to business as usual. Just like the Jews. Same thing. Why? Well, because the world began to influence what they believed about God. And for hundreds of years this went on, you know, and, and when, you, when you do bad, you generally, and, and you're not account, held accountable for it, you generally get better at it. You know, you might cheat a little bit here on your taxes and you don't get caught and you make a few bucks. Then you cheat a little bit more on your taxes and you get more bucks and you don't get caught. What are you going to do the third year? And you're going to push the envelope every year and, get, and slowly get worse and worse. That's called sin. If you want to liken it to a modern day phenomenon, it's called cancer. Get a little spot on your arm here, a little mole, little odd shape something something. Ah, it's nothing. It's just a spot. And the next thing you know, gosh, my shoulder hurts me so bad. And then pretty soon, man, I can't hardly breathe anymore. Then you go to the doctor and the x-ray, and you go, well, you got lung cancer. We think it spread from your shoulder that probably came from this little melanoma over here. What happened? <clears throat> well, that's what sin is. That's what the world is. Like sheep, we've all gone astray. We've all toyed with that little bit of sin, that little bit of evil, that little bit of what's in it for me. Come on, we've all put ourselves up on that throne at least for a day and said, ta -da! I am Tom the Great. So if you want to start pointing fingers, well, he conquered a world, well, he did this or he did that or she did that. Who cares? You know, it's all relative. It's so like I say, if you're hanging over a cliff by a chain, how many links in that chain got to break before you plummet to your death? This one. That's what Jesus meant when he said the wages of sin are death. Don't even mess with it. Put it away from you. You got a problem with your brother? Go take care of that problem. Then come back and praise God. What's he talking about? Well, I'll tell you what he's talking about. If you're going to believe in me, then live like you do. Let my influence define your life, not the other way around. It's all through the scriptures. Front to back, beginning to end, stem to stern, one to ten. It's a cliche festival. <laughs> all right, that's it. That's chapter three. Get out of here.